Welcome. It's nice to have you here. I hope you enjoy it. I think you will. You're listening to the Jam Session Podcast. I was told that I could listen to the radio at a reasonable volume. With Cowboys insider... What's your name? Jean-Jacques Taylor. That's my name. Radio personality and craft beer expert, Matt McLaren. He's a very strange young man. He's an idiot. Comes from upbringing. And now, the Jam Session Podcast. It is indeed Jam Session. Subscribe, rate, and review, and hang out with us for a while. Right here on the Jam Session Podcast. The moment we've all been waiting for has arrived. Ladies and gentlemen, the radio, TV, and now podcast star, the sexy Jean-Jacques Taylor. What up, Doc? I would be the non-sexy one, Matt McLaren. And this is Jam Session, the podcast, version 20, asking simply that you prepare to be dazzled. If not entertained. And as always, we like to start you off by telling you about some of our sponsors, including our lawyer, I guess, attorney, Chris W. Fitzgerald with Fitzgerald Law. He can help you. He does what they call virtual law practice, which means you don't even have to meet him person to person, especially in these times, rising COVID numbers, courts are changing things. A lot of them are moving from in-person hearings to telephonic or Zoom type meetings. And Chris can do all of that for you. If you've got questions, we talked about this the last time. Maybe you don't have a will and you need to get one made. Maybe you should look into that. Contracts. I, I had some questions for him when we were forming our business that he helped me with. Business transactions, consumer bankruptcy. Chris W. Fitzgerald can answer all those for you with Fitzgerald Law. And again, he is a master of the virtual law practice, able to handle pretty much all your needs almost exclusively online. You can contact him. You can give him a call if you'd like. 972-842-4220 or, of course, probably the easier way. Check him out online at chrisfitzgeraldlaw.com. Also, of course, our buddies, JR and the guys at Freeway Tire Shop. Easy to get to in Dallas. It's right there off of I-35. Like, if you're going north out of downtown where it splits to go 183 to 35, if you stay on 35, it's over in that area. And they'll get you taken care of, man, from state inspections to oil changes, the general mechanic work. And as I mentioned, I mean, it's called Freeway Tire Shop. So, of course, they have tires for you with competitive pricing. Just the best customer service. They're going to take care of our jam session audience. So get over there for your car maintenance needs and check out what they do at freewaytireshop.com where you can schedule an appointment, request a quote. Again, that's freewaytireshop.com. And of course, let's not forget about those wings at Kroger. I know it's yeah, been baby. the weekend. Many of you have been getting them. Maybe you throw them in the air fryer like Jacques does. Maybe you're a grill guy like me. They're available at most North Texas Kroger locations. Not all, but most. There's the Buffalo Blue Cheese, which you prefer. And there's the Mango Habanero, which I'm a big fan of. You can buy a couple of pounds, throw them on the grill, have them ready to go. They're not breaded like most wings, so you just get the meat and you get the flavor. That's what they do, and they are fantastic. Many of you like to let us know that you're trying those wings that you get at Kroger, so keep it coming, man. Quite tasty. Find them at the meat section. You just go back to the back or wherever it is in your Kroger, and you go up to the guy at the counter and tell him, hey, I want those wings in the window there, and they'll get you taken care of. Yeah, and try them in the air fryer. Yeah, if you've got one. That's one thing we should discuss at some point, figuring out what can you put in an air fryer, because I don't have one, and I know that you do. Is what can't you put in an air fryer? Right. And you can air fry everything. It's technology at its finest. Yes, it is. But we'll get rolling here on this version of the podcast. And I know many of you will be listening to this as the Cowboys will be coming off of their bye weekend, moving into, we call it the second half of the season. Obviously, it's not exactly halfway since there's only seven games left. They've played nine. There are two and seven team that will be facing a Minnesota Vikings team and a red hot Dalvin Cook next week. But this is going to be an interesting look here as we take a look at what kind of the expectation is for the second half. And we've talked about this before, Jacques. For a 2-7 and seven team, I keep thinking somewhere along the way they find another win, but I couldn't tell you where it comes. No, I mean, you think they'll find another win. And I would, I would submit to you this. I thought they played a solid game against Pittsburgh. It wasn't a great game. It was just a solid game. If they were able to play that type of game, how many games they got left? They seven got seven games yeah. left. If yeah. they were able to play that, 
game three or four more times, then they'd they'd win one or two more games. Problem, however, is that's a solid game. wasn't even a good game. It's just a solid game. And brother, that's the first one we probably seen in eight weeks. So <laughs> it's true. Yeah, I'm being serious. Like you know, can they replicate that? I have no idea. And then here's the other problem: if you play your solid game against Baltimore, then you know perhaps you get beat. 31-17, 31-20, okay? But you get beat. So you got to play your solid game against the right team. Like if you can play your solid game against Cincinnati, okay, you might be able to win that one. But that's the problem, man. And they got to play fairly flawless, Doc. Yeah, and it, it, it is an interesting setup this next month because keep in mind, they, they do that back-to-back Thursday night game because they play Sunday, the 22nd, and then they turn around for the Thanksgiving Day just a few days later against Washington here in Dallas. And then the next Thursday they play on the road in Baltimore for the Thursday nighter. And then they've got like almost like another mini buy where they play 10 days after that in Cincinnati. So it's an interesting four weeks that are coming up. I don't think they're going to beat the Vikings. I don't know what we expect that's going to be so drastically different than what we have seen so far this season. It sounds like if Andy Dalton is healthy and ready to go, that he's going to be the quarterback. That being said, I don't know that the offensive line all of a sudden magically gets better. Now, I think at least for one sample size against the Steelers, what we saw with some of the moves they've made defensively, there does look to be maybe some hunger with some of the younger guys defensively. But once you get to two and eight, and then if you lose to Washington again on Thanksgiving and you're 2-9 and nine, I, I, and the Ravens smoke you, I wonder at what point some of that energy and some of that fight just starts to slowly fade away as it becomes more and more obvious where this is going. Um, you know, I've said this many times in the past. What happens is, you know, because you'll get people, fans, you'll get some media, oh, they quit, they quit, they quit. And that's really not what happened, man. What happened, and if, if, if they get to the 2-9, and 2-10, and 10, all that stuff, what happens is – Instead of doing my film work and preparation for three hours every after every game, you know, three hours a day during the week, yeah, I do it for for an hour, or I do it for forty five minutes, or I just glance at it, or I do it while I'm watching Netflix. You know what I'm saying? Your your mental commitment is not the same. So then, when it shows up on game day, instead of going, oh, they're in this formation, that means they're they're running one of two plays. You don't even know what they're running. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. so it's it's your mental preparation during the week that wanes, and that's why it looks like you quit during the game because you just don't know what's going on and you're a step slow. And in the NFL, when you're a step slow, you're done. Yeah, it, it's – it's going to be interesting to see exactly how this season concludes. And when you take a look at the second half and those four games that we mentioned, and of course, I think most people are aware, once you get into Christmas week, you close out after Cincinnati, you've got the two home games against the 49ers and the Eagles. And then, of course, you close it out against the Giants. And that'll be the 2020 season for you. It'll go quickly. I, I just don't know that anything is going to be that much different than what we've already seen. And and again, like you kind of mentioned, maybe your A game is what we saw against Pittsburgh. And if you're able to figure out a way to throw that out there again at some point along the way, I I still think they win another game. I don't think they're going to finish two and 14. I don't think so. I mean, I'm with you. I I could see them winning another one. I just I'm like also with you. I I have no idea where it's coming from. Um, You know, Washington, you would think that's a game you could win, but they destroyed you defensively. Um, and so you're just trying to figure out, I don't know how you get past that. The Giants, I told you, the Giants' last game of the season is one in which both teams would prefer to lose uh, because they'll be battling out for a draft pick. Uh, but somebody's got to win unless they tie. But if you think about Jason Garrett on that staff and you think about Joe Judge right. on that staff, they're going to be playing to win. I can't see them playing to lose. Uh, so, you know, it's a lot of moving parts, man, but it's kind of sad and pathetic that we got to talk about this in November. Like, hey, will the Cowboys win another game this year? I don't know, bro. Uh, hey, you tell me. Yeah. That's it, how far they've fallen. It, it's true. It, and it's it's really, really weird. You know, San Francisco will be interesting to me, I imagine, because I believe that game is set right now for a Sunday night. Surely it's going to get flexed because San Francisco right now is four and five. They've struggled. I wouldn't be surprised if San Francisco goes the next four games 
and let's say that they arrive and, and they're whatever it is and they go one and three and they're five and seven or whatever it is at that point of the season you know I could see San Francisco losing a little bit of that fight as a team that really had high hopes last year and made a run to get to the point where they're at now, where they're struggling. They're at the bottom of the division as we sit here right now. I mean, obviously that could change. We shall see. But it, it, that that's one of those games that'll be interesting. The, the Bengals game, of course, Washington, the Giants. There's opportunities for Dallas if they play the way they played against the Steelers to get a win or two. I, I still think 4-12 and 12 is the ceiling on this thing. I have a hard time believing because there's only seven games left. I mean... How many of us think they're going to go three and four? I, I don't see that happening, which means at, at max, if they go two and five in the last seven games, that's a four and 12 season. Oh, I think Steven and Jerry think that. <laughs> they're so delusional. That's so silly. <laughs> based on what? And that's the based on what you have seen with the defense that literally, I mean, maybe I guess you can say that they finally figured out a little thing on defense, but they're still making the same dumb mistakes. We went through that whole thing with the Steelers in the fourth quarter. At what point, I mean, does it just magically fix itself during the I don't think so. <laughs> that's that's what happens when you don't deal in facts, man, and you deal in reality. I mean, you don't deal in reality. You deal in what you would like to help, you like to have happen, what you think will happen, what what should happen, as opposed to what is happening. You know, you tell me, man, if you've committed 20 turnovers in your first nine games, and they almost break down specifically into two a game, two or three a game, why is that suddenly going to stop as you get a young quarterback? Or, you know, I mean, I just don't see why it's going to stop. Uh, you know, maybe it will, but until it does, it's not up to me to believe that it will. And, you know, the Cowboys a lot of times want you to believe this will stop. Okay, why? <laughs> you know, until it does, <laughs> it's I don't believe right. it will. Yeah. Um, you know, and so, um, and I'm not just like that with the Cowboys. I'm like that with a lot of things. Um, and just, you know, I told my, my granddaughter the other day, who's a brilliant person, but who's having a hard time in school this year because she's not applying herself, Matt. Uh oh, sounds familiar to me. And I was like, uh, I believe your grades change when they, when they do. Yeah. <laughs> she's like, but I'm working hard now. I said, check this out, baby. When they change, that's when I believe they will have changed. And if you're working hard, then they'll change, and then I'll believe it when I see it, when I log in and see that all your grades are back where they should be, not this uh, poop you've been, you've been bringing home. <laughs> yeah. Okay, just for a background, Matt, we're talking about somebody who had one B in their first eight years of school. That's incredible. So, so that's what we're talking about. So, I, you know, I'm not being the taskmaster here. I'm just saying, hey, do what you're supposed to do. God, if I'd only had one B or if I had had a B my first eight years of school, my parents would have been like, oh, my God, you're a genius. <laughs> well, yeah. Now, I got to tell you, Matt, she set herself up for this. Right. She set herself up for this. If she had been a normal student, wouldn't be no problem. But since she wasn't, hey, meet your standard, girl. Well, see, and I think that terrible. I think that's actually a great analogy for this team because there's so many players that we feel that way about on this squad right now. Right. Where we yeah. feel you have shown us. And I, we've talked th that this is you have shown Jaylen us in, Smith right, is like the poster child. easily, easily Jalen leads the charge of that. But there's others as well that have shown us in years past. They are capable of performing at a certain level. Now, some of them haven't done it in a couple of years. Some of them, they're just showing up and doing it and failing us this year. But the reality of it is there's some hard questions that they're going to have to ask themselves as they move forward in this offseason and figuring out because the team that we're looking at right now. In injuries, yes, they play a part. But the team that's playing on the field right now, they don't even have a window that's open. Now, if they're going to bring Dak back, and that changes a little bit, but it, it, it's almost like Dak helped to cover up some of these glaring holes that this roster has and this lack of talent that we're seeing in different position groups where they either they trick themselves and believe they had something and they don't, or the reality of... That next man up crap, the Cowboys don't have a next man up. When some of these guys get hurt, there's no next man up. It's dudes off the street that they're trying to throw in there. Well, yeah, I mean, some of that is when you get so injured, that's what happens. You you do end up – like, Savion Smith is not supposed to be playing for the Cowboys. I mean, but there he is out there getting right. front and center and giving up two huge plays in the fourth quarter. I mean, in an ideal world, he never, ever sees the field. But injury and circumstance thrust him on there. You had to play him, and, and uh, you paid for it. 
It's been a perfect storm, it feels like. I mean, this Cowboys season, as 2020 has gone, it, it's like a microcosm of all of our 2020s. And it's just a colossal throwaway season for this Dallas team. Because, again, when you look at the second half, at best, at best, I think they finish 4-12, and 12, which could be exciting. Because if they finish 4-12, and 12, then you're virtually assured of a top five pick. And we'll see what they decide to do if that were to happen. But... Three and 13, four or 12 is where this thing's going to end up. And it's going to be another one of those head scratchers where you look at this team over the course of the last couple of seasons, a team that had championship aspirations that kept Jason Garrett around for one more run after that playoff loss to the Rams. And they go eight and eight and then follow it up with a three and 13, four and 12 season. You're not going in the right direction, man. <laughs> no, that's that's going the complete opposite way. But maybe uh, maybe the draft picks will be the thing that helps rebuild this franchise. Maybe it is because they're going to need an infusion of youthful talent at a variety of positions. So we shall see as we continue with you here on Jam Session. Let's tell you about another one of our great sponsors, Blue Star Motor Group, who's awaiting Jacques call for that kick ass Camaro they have. <laughs> We were telling you about this the other day. They specialize in superior quality Carfax certified pre-owned vehicles of all makes and models. But right now they are featuring a quite the rare find, a 2020 Camaro 2SS 1LE track performance package. Only 369 miles are on this thing. It is showroom condition. The MSRP on it was over 50 grand. They have it right now at Blue Star Motor Group for 44991. Dude, it's basically a brand new car. Vroom, vroom, baby. So I'd love to ride it, but you know, I, I'm assuming you'll be calling Deb to <laughs> inquire about this unbelievable find. You know, I may call Deb. Uh, I really might. But then I'm going to need a place to stay. <laughs> <laughs> so if they sold enough houses, enough cars, and they got an extra bedroom for your boy. I might be able to work it out. That's awesome. So whether you're Jacques and you're looking for a Camaro or you're looking for a variety of makes and models, Blue Star Motor Group can set you up. Call Deb at 817-881-4066. Find them on Instagram. You can check out their customer reviews and, of course, their website as well with inventory and pricing. They'll get you taken care of. They're big fans of Jam Session. We're fans of them. So support them for all your car shopping needs at bluestarmotorgroup.com. But as we do from time to time, we like to, we used to call it between the mics, still kind of is, off-air stories that we have when we're just hanging around talking with each other that we like to bring on air to you. And you brought this up earlier because I believe this is fascinating to you, and that is my, I don't even know what to call it, my ascension into the world of birds. (laughs) Yeah, man, see, you know, I mean, I think it's... um I think it is fascinating uh, because I'm just going to throw it out there on Twitter and ask people, how many of you guys, that's just the way I'm going to phrase it, uh, have a bird, what should I call it, a bird feeder? Yeah, a bird feeder for sure. That's what it is, yeah. Okay, how many of you guys have a bird feeder and then you sit in your house with binoculars to see what kind of species come through? Okay, I don't have binoculars. That I'm sitting on the couch like I'm 94 years old. Like, oh, look at that one. But I will say, <laughs> some people like you have four or more TVs. I have four oh. or more bird feeders. Oh, take a shot at my well. No, I, I'm just saying I have four or more bird feeders because it's not just one bird feeder. You got more? You got? I thought you just had a solo bird feeder. No, we have four. <laughs> four? Yeah. Oh, you better keep it secret, man, because... <laughs> I've been over to your house and I said, awesome. I remember saying, is that your bird feeder? And you said, yes. You oh, didn't I, say, oh, yes, but I've got three others. And a, uh, I mean, you can a, see uh, them my, all from the window. Thing? Uh, menagerie in the backyard. Yeah. Yeah. We have the one bird feeder that we put a uh, black sunflower seed in is the one that's closest to the window. Why and then we get black sunflower seeds. I, they just seem to like them. That that attracts quite a wide variety of bird. And then in our other bird feeder, which is out further past the patio, is a bigger one that has. So there's this there's a type of feed called suet, and suet is put together for woodpeckers. It's a harder type of like a block of seed essentially, and right. so woodpeckers like that. So that has two suet cages on it, 
And then it also has a place for all the other birds to go. And we put a different kind of seed in there that has like a mix of corn and safflower and sunflower and a couple of other different things that are in that one. Then we have a hummingbird feeder, which right now it isn't hummingbird season. So we actually just need to take that one down because they only come around in mainly in October and March. But those are great. Um, and then we have another woodpecker feeder that's wow. on the side by itself. That, so you got a real woodpecker who comes and visits. Yeah, we do from time to time. I mean, part of the weird thing is with the suet that some of the birds, it's the craziest thing. Like they'll jump down in the little cage and peck away at the suet. And then you'll see it get stuck on their beaks because some of these birds, their beaks aren't made for that type of food, really. <laughs> and you're like, what are you doing? Like good food is right there for you. These birds are nuts, man. I mean, sometimes okay. like a whole flock will come in and a couple of them will jump up on the feeder and just knock down a bunch of seed for all the other birds that are on the ground. Really? Yeah. It's I've like got, ha- I've got several questions. OK. Like, <laughs> like, how much do you spend on bird feed? Like, oh, what does bird forever. feed cost? No, I'll buy like a 20 pound bag of bird feed and it'll last. Man, I'd have to look up on Amazon when the last time I ordered it was. It probably lasts 10 weeks. All right, so that's and it costs like twenty something dollars, probably twenty five bucks. But that's just you told me you got like five different kinds of seed that you're throwing out there. Yeah, I mean, okay, so my lady friend, her brother came and visited us and gifted us one of our bird feeders and brought with him a bunch of different kinds of seed. And he's like, yeah, try these. These are good because I also have some like dried mealworms that I'll put out as like a treat for them. (laughs) What the hell is that? I don't know, man. Those are you like got worms just floating around your crib. Well, they're in the garage, but they're 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 dead. They're like, I don't know, like astro frozen, whatever, you know, like dehydrated worms is what they look like. Uh, this is like MREs for birds. Yeah, yeah. And they love those. That's like a treat for them. So I put those out there whenever I refill it and kind of scatter them around. They're like, all right, look at these great <laughs> worms. Wow. I know. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> now, did we get into the or or, or um, origin? I was trying to see if it was origin or origination. It's oh, origin yeah. of, of of how you became Mott the Bird Watcher from Scotland. Yes, of course. So if you go back two years ago. No, we were we were on one of our furlough weeks. The lady and I went to visit her family in Arkansas, and her stepdad is is a like a like he knows birds. What do you call those guys? No, a or, bird knower ornithologist kind of like whatever a bird knower <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine that here's my card oh bird knower that's great <laughs> but he he can identify all kinds of different birds and so on their property up there in arkansas they have like some like unbelievably gorgeous birds they have one called an indigo blue bunting which is a small little bird and it is just the coolest color of blue i mean it's basically indigo blue which is why they call it that. And it's gorgeous. And we we were up there and I was talking about those. And so the next time we saw them, her mom just gave us a bird feeder. And we're like, oh, this will be cool. And so she gave us a bird feeder and like a book of birds and stuff, uh, like a thing you can flip through to identify different birds. And so from there, once we put up the first one and, and we started seeing all these different birds coming around, we're like, man, this is awesome. Like the Blue Jays and the Cardinals, which are really bright colored and I don't know, you just kind of start like, man, what else can we get to come into our yard? So then you go and you start looking at different kinds of seeds and kind of so went, this, went from there. <laughs> all right. I'm just all intrigued by this, man. I'm all intrigued. I never f- pictured you as a bird watcher, man. I never pictured myself as this, but I, I, you know, there are times where I'll just be standing there at the kitchen sink, looking out the, at the backyard for like 10 minutes, watching all these birds jumping around doing whatever it is that they like to do playing or whatever now obviously like right now because it's the middle of november you don't have the wide variety that we had when it was warmer you know but some of them do stick around and i've actually read where in the winter months when it's cold having bird feeders can really attract and help birds because it's a harder time for them to find food obviously because insects and whatnot aren't as plentiful as they would be during the summer months now what happened to your boys the squirrels Oh, the squirrels. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the squirrels, they've stopped getting up on the bird feeders. I've deterred them from doing that enough times where I think they realize maybe don't do that anymore. BB gun? No, no, I don't. I I just if you catch them at the right moment and scare the crap out of them, then I think that they realize, man, when I go over here, something really scary happens. (laughs) I don't know. How do you scare the crap? out? I just open the door and like scream at them. (laughs) 
And you'll see, I mean, these things, like if you, if you find a squirrel and it doesn't realize that you're at the door, you can open it real quick and yell at it. And it'll just like jump way up in the air and freak out and take off. <laughs> Dude, you got to take a video next time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. It's kind of funny, you know, but it, it's, I don't know. It's really interesting. Like we've talked about, cause I mean, we, we rent our home, but we just signed up for another year back in September. And as far as I know, we don't have any plans to leave. We, we like living here. And so it's one of those things, like when the spring comes back around, we've talked about even expanding, getting another bird feeder, maybe putting in like a bird bath. <laughs> No, go ahead. I'd like to see some naked birds bathing. You know, and so it's, I don't know what it is. It's just one of those, I guess it's like a yard hobby. And, you know, we planted some flowers and stuff last summer. And we'll probably even do more of that. Like our, when the spring comes back around, we're going to dig up the front area of the house and put some flowers and stuff out front. So we may put some bird stuff out there, but I don't know, just trying to make it where you like looking at it when you pull up to the house or you like sitting out back and you see the flowers and the birds kind of cool. All right, I'm I'm down for that. I'm, I think I'm going to do a little backyard landscaping myself. Uh, yeah, because you just spring. got like a big patio thing or whatever. Yeah, you know, we could have done a hole between the mics on the Lovely Rain's quest for patio furniture. Oh, yeah. Uh, to which I, I was involved, and then I wonder if she'll listen to this. Then I removed myself from the process. <laughs> <laughs> it was too much? It was too much, man. It's just, it's too, it's too many options, too many questions. Yep. I I merely put out a budgetary figure. That's awesome. And said, uh, let's try to stick within this budget and uh, let's chat if it goes beyond this budget. Dude, it is crazy because patio furniture can end up running you like a new living room set. Well, I mean, basically it is. Uh, yeah. But, you know, the thing about it is uh, you just got to figure out what you want and what you're trying to do. And, you know, then you can go from there and figure out, you know, how much you want to spend and uh, and all of that. Yeah, it's interesting because when we got some patio furniture, which was coming up, I think we got it for my party last year in time for that because we knew people were going to go outside and stuff right before the pandemic hit earlier this year. And, right. you know, she ended up going out and she bought all these pillows and I don't think we've ever used any of them except if we have people over and then she'll put them out like as de it's just decorations or whatever. Oh, yeah. You know, I think uh, the patio turned out really nice. Um, if you can picture it, it's about 10 by 28. So what so they, they came like they came in and laid concrete and stuff for that. Yeah. OK. And it's the uh, length of the back. Well, not the entire length, but like I said, it's a good sized patio. So you have to figure out what you're going to do with it because the guy who built it was like, I'm just giving you the base right now, you know, cause I want, cause he actually said, why don't you go out there and hang out there for two or three weeks a month and then let me know what you think. He goes, because your patio is so big. He goes, we could build a bar for you here. We yeah. can do this. We could do that. It's, it's just a matter of what you want. And I was like, dude, that's, I, that, I'm overwhelmed. I can't think about that right now. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the other thing about patio furniture is what? It's November. And so ain't no patio furniture available to look at because we're yeah. going into wintertime. And the other thing is there's no patio furniture to look at. Do you know why, Matt? Aside from the, from the uh, changing of the seasons, there's one other key reason why there's no patio furniture to look at right now. I, I, other than thinking about why would you carry that type of inventory, I don't know. No, here's the deal. And this guy told me this because obviously he does this for a living. Yeah. He goes, the pandemic hit and business for roofers and construction people who add on to your homes. He goes, it was absolutely positively awful. Mm. And we're trying to figure out how we, you know, he's like me and my wife. We're trying to figure out how we're going to feed the kids, how we're going to eat. Because, you know, this pandemic is it's not ending anytime soon. And then he said this. He said, all of a sudden, though, my phone started ringing and then it started ringing and then it started ringing off the hook. And then I had to have the answering machine take it because I couldn't handle all the calls. You know what happened? People said, hell, I'm stuck at home. I might as well make my house great. And so people started oh, building dude, patios. Yes. Huh. They started building patios. He said, I've done more patios this year than I've done the last three or four years combined. That's incredible. Because people I mean, were like, sense. I'm yeah. stuck at home. I need to make my home as nice and as livable as possible because now I'm spending more and more and more and more time here. And if you've got like a home office, 
that maybe you used to hang out a little bit. Well, now you're like working from there. You're like, well, when I'm done working, I won't be here anymore. I want to go to some other part of the house. So, yeah, he said patio business was booming. And that's why you can't find any patio furniture now, because everybody bought it in the spring months and the summer months when they were building new patios. God, that's fascinating. But it makes a lot of sense. I, I wouldn't have even thought of something like that. But, that you know, that's part of the reason why we did what we did with putting in like some flower beds and doing things like that in our backyard because we had a lot of time obviously this summer when we weren't going anywhere and we were spending more time outside sitting around instead of going out to places we would sit in the back patio way more than we had probably previously because of all that yeah well that's how it works huh makes a lot of sense well, I'm glad yeah. you've got a patio now you can enjoy it. Now you just need a few bird feeders. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was going to tell you one more thing, man. All right. You said something interesting, like you and your lady friend, you're renting this really nice place in Irving, and you're like, we kind of like this joint. We, we kind of cool here. Yeah. Let me tell you who's happier. Who's the only person happier than you, bro? Your landlord. <laughs> That's true. They probably because, are. Because uh, when we had a rental property, man, we had one great tenant for about eight, of the 17 years we had it and those eight years ah they were glorious the rent showed up on time mm-hmm. and very few phone calls about fix this she took great care of the house it was fantastic and then she left man and it was like a it was like a football player you know eight years with one team and then dude it was like five tenants in six years God, that's crazy but it is which is a drag it is like that and and it's funny because they'll come over maybe a couple of times a year like he actually came over last week because he wanted to put some fertilizer down to help the grass through the winter and stuff and you know i talked to him he, they're they're a cool couple and we get along with them well and i think that they i think you're right i think they really like that like holy crap i mean we take good care of the house like they see the improvements that we've made to the backyard and putting in flowers and stuff like that and doing those types of things. And they've been really cool. I mean, he's been, Hey, whatever you want to do to the yard, man, if you're going to make it look like that, go for it. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that they're probably very happy with us, which was great because when we renewed our lease and, and granted, everybody knows it's a pandemic and whatnot, but they didn't raise the rent on us at all. Just kept it the same and everything's you know been why? great. So because good tenants are hard to find the, whatever you raise the rent, is really not making a difference in your life (laughs) because you're not going to raise it a hundred dollars. Right. So, you know, if you raise it 25 bucks or 50 bucks, it's still though 50 bucks a month is not changing your life. You'd rather just, can we just be happy? Y'all just be happy. And if you got really minor repairs, maybe y'all can take care of those and we'll just leave the rent as is. Makes sense to me, but that's the story. There you go. Bird feeders and patios, man. (laughs) Get them ready for your 2021. (laughs) So we continue with you here on the Jam Session podcast. And I want to tell you about one of our great sponsors again. They sponsor Just the Sip every week. They continue to provide fantastic local and craft beers from around the world. And that's Beer Geek Shop in downtown Rockwall. Hundreds of beers from around the world. A local family-owned store right there off the square in downtown Rockwall. And one of the cool things that we're excited about They are now offering the Jam Session six-pack. Saw a couple of you on Twitter that had picked it up over the weekend. It's three of my favorite beers, three of Jacques' favorite beers, all in one six-pack at a discounted price. You get six beers for $22.50. And when I saw that, I was like, holy cow, because you've got, you, you know, you threw in a couple of stats. You've got Lakewood Temptresses in there. Odd Muse, one of their new brewers, one of the new breweries, excuse me, that opened during the pandemic over in Farmer's Branch. They've got some Odd Muse cans, which are not available. I don't know if anywhere else has them outside of the brewery, but they've got them at Beer Geek Shop and Silver Spaceship. One of their original hazy IPAs is in my three. A fantastic range of beers. And again, that's the Jam Session six pack available for you at Beer Geek Shop in downtown Rockwell. I think it's really a. Uh it's really a great taster testers kit if you're a beer if you're a craft beer newbie because you really do get a bunch of different styles whether it's the hazy IPA or whether it's the pepper beer or whether it's a couple of different styles and all that man or if it's a you know it's just a, it's a good way it's a good starter man and um, I'm with you and Matt's telling the truth now he saw the price and he sent me a text He's like oh my god I can't believe they did them that low I know I couldn't because I thought I was like yeah it'd be cool if you could discount it a little bit for our listeners and when she sent it back to me I was like okay or a lot so that's <laughs> that also is awesome so you know get out there and and pick up the jam session six pack today at beer geek shop in downtown Rockwall but we're going to continue the conversation and take a look back at the Cowboys because I know 
defensively, and it's been this way for the last couple of years, Jalen Smith has been the ire of the Cowboys fan eye. It feels like in 2020, the target on offense that people are starting to get very frustrated with is Zeke Elliott. Oh, I don't think there's any doubt about that. They see the contract, six years, 90 million. They see the production, uh, not that great. Uh, 500 and something yards, uh, 3.9 per carry, four fumbles lost. And they go, what the hell, dude? What's up with you? What's wrong with you? You're not the Zeke. We we saw the first couple of years, you know, somebody just sent me a tweet that said uh, Zeke hadn't had a 40-yard run since 2018. You know, basically, emanate, uh, you know, trying to say he's just a guy. And I always tell people this. You want the 20-yard runs, okay? You want them. I'm not saying you don't want them. You want them. But you got to keep it in perspective. Last year, Zeke Elliott, I think, was third in the league amongst running backs in runs of 10 yards or more. Those runs are much more likely than the long ones. Uh, You want the long ones, but as long as he's leading the league or amongst the league leaders in 10-yard runs or more, you're good. Now, he's not there this year. And so you have to ask the question, and it's a hard question because he's 25, which means he's closer to 28 and the end of his career than the beginning of his career. Uh, but you have to ask yourself, why is there, why are his numbers down? Career low in carries. Why has he got a career low in carries, Matt? I would submit to you. Now, he plays a role in some of this, Matt. I am not absolving Zeke of blame. But if you ask yourself, why is he amongst the career low in carries, 16 and a half per game? Just about two fewer than last year. Because they're getting their butts kicked every game, and they have to abandon the run and throw the ball to try to get back in the game. That's mm-hmm. why he's not carrying the ball as much as he has been in the past. Right. I mean, I don't really think it's all that complicated if you pay attention to the game. So the carries are down. And the biggest factor of that is in, I think, and uh, Calvin Watkins wrote a story about this in the Dallas Morning News on Sunday, and it's worth a read. But I believe uh, Calvin said he had five carries with a lead in the fourth quarter. Now, if you compare that. That's incredible. Well, see, you think that's incredible. He only had five carries with a lead in the fourth quarter. Jeez. Go back and look at the benchmark year. 2016 is the benchmark year. He had like 170 carries in the fourth quarter, dog, with a lead, which is crazy. You know what I'm saying? It is crazy. And, you know, we saw this with the Steelers last week, and I would imagine it's going to be this way for the duration of the season. When Dak is not around, and even when Dak was around, to your point, they didn't have a lead a lot. You know, but when Dak goes down and you're playing Garrett Gilbert or Andy Dalton or Ben DiNucci or whoever it is, and Mike Tomlin and and the Steelers basically said this to the media leading up to the last game, they had no concerns whatsoever about anything on offense other than, okay, it starts with Zeke. If we can slow him down and focus on him, good luck doing anything else. No, that's exactly what it said. So that's why his carries are career low. Now you got to look at his yards per game. Why why is his yards per game at a career low, Matt? Why is he averaging 60-something yards per game? Number one, they're behind all the time, so they're not running. The carries and the yards go hand in hand. That's number one, all right? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And he's part of that problem because some of his fumbles led to blowouts in the first half where they had to abandon the running game. Yep. So, again, I'm not absolving him of any blame whatsoever. That's why his yards are down. Another reason why his yards are down, he's not making the eighth guy in the box miss. Mm -hmm. That's on him. Okay? Every offensive coordinator will tell you, we account for seven guys. Hey, Zeke, the eighth guy is yours. Put the dookie stick on him, <laughs> run him over, you know, show him a leg and take it away like your girl do. It's whatever, dog. Make him miss. He hasn't done that with regularity. Thus, you get six yards instead of 20, okay? And then the third reason, so, I mean, he's had fewer carries. He's not making the eighth defender miss with regularity. And the third reason, Matt, the offensive line ain't no good. Right. They're just average. Now, This is the part of the conversation where I say, hey, Matt, I've been married twice. Partly, you have these conversations, we've been married twice. And here's, and I'm going to ask you, am I making excuses or am I giving you reasons? And at various times, my different wives had said, what's the difference? I said, okay, fine. Let me tell you what the difference is. Because to me, 
There's a difference between an excuse and a reason. Right. To me, this is your boy now, your boy. An excuse is, it's not my fault because. That's an excuse. I don't accept responsibility for it. It's not my fault, but here's why it happened. The alarm didn't go off. That's why I was late. That's an excuse. The teacher didn't give me the right assignment. That's why I didn't turn it in. That's an excuse. Excuses are BS. Okay? Yep. Get your ass up. You know you had to go. Set three alarms. Tell your mama to wake you up. Tell your girl to call you. Get your ass up and go. Yeah, it, it, it's it's getting to a point because this is going to be interesting. And, and this gives you some perspective on what we're talking about as far as carries and all this. Like right now, Zeke is on pace for 266 carries. The only other time he failed to crack 300 carries in a season was the 2016, or excuse me, the 2017 right. years when he missed six That's games. Yeah. Okay. And so here's the thing. He's on pace for 266. That season, he had 242 in 10 games. So he's on pace to have about 24 more carries with six more games, ideally, assuming that he plays all 16. And that kind of tells you the thing here. And this is an interesting world that the Cowboys are walking down. And, and it's not just Zeke. They're going to have to make the decision on some other guys and where they truly, honestly believe that they're at and not the public persona that they try to act like for everybody of butts and seats. Hey, we're going to be competitive and all that. Do you truly believe that you are? Because Zeke, you're not walking away from him in, at the end of 2020. It's too much money on the dead cap. If they were to walk away from him, then it's $24.5 million on the cap next year. That's not going to happen. But after 2021, before he goes into his age 27 season, you know, we've kind of all looked at this originally as a four year deal. He's never going to see the last two years of this deal. It was just never going to happen. They'll eat the 6.7 right. hit. But after next season, do they then walk away and take a $10.8 million dead cap hit? We'll see. But you have to look at this and some of the things that you're pointing out. Is it, and we talked about this, how much more effective would he be with the healthy DAC all season long? How effective right. would he be if we weren't starting at times two undrafted rookies and a fourth round rookie and a dude playing his first snaps ever in the NFL in the offensive line. What if Tyron Smith come back and Lyle Collins come back next year and maybe they're not as good. Maybe Smith is in decline. Who knows? But you're still not going to be as bad as you were this year. If those things are going to happen, are we going to get the value that we believed he was when we signed into this contract or can we get what we're getting from Zeke with Tony Pollard? Right. That's the that's the sixty four thousand dollar question. Or see, let's take it to the other end. Can you get like I think they like Tony Pollard. Mm -hmm. So you say, hey, Tony Pollard, let's sign you to a nice running back contract. Four years, 20 million, something, you know, whatever. You know right. what I mean? Some kind of lower. You get a big raise. You make it five million a year and we'll take care of you that way. And then you draft another running back, you team him with him, and you go with the tandem system where, you know, you got two guys who are splitting the carries, blah, 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 blah. You know, I, I think that's that's an that's an option down the road if you don't if you if Zeke is not giving you elite running perspective. Now check this out, man. It don't even have to be his fault, okay? If he's not giving you elite running back perspective because your offensive line is trash. And I'm just saying this. I don't have any information to this. And, you know, Tyron retires. Right. And Lyle Collins coming off a of double hip surgery is just a guy. And so basically your offensive line is not elite and it's not good. Okay, you're wasting Zeke at $90 million a year. So, okay, fine. We don't, you don't, we don't have a line anymore, so get rid of him and get two lower-level guys who can do the same thing he can do uh, with this particular line with less money involved. These are all the hard questions you got to ask, man. Yeah, and, and you know, the thing with Tony Pollard, I know everybody wants, especially now, it's it's easy, and it makes sense. I, I mean, we all watch the games. You see how explosive Tony Pollard looks, but I would I would just encourage this and, and keep this in perspective. Tony Pollard, since he left high school, has played five seasons. Three seasons at Memphis. He's in his second season with the Cowboys. He has never carried the ball more than 14 times in the NFL. He only carried it in college more than 10 times twice. 
So this is a dude, again, he was with Daryl Henderson at Memphis, and to your point about bringing in somebody else, he has always been a tandem back. He has never, in his collegiate or up to this point in his NFL career, been a featured back. Can he? I don't know. But he has never played that role. So to me, maybe you can start getting Tony Pollard where he's regularly getting 10 to 14 carries. And then you bring in somebody else who's kind of like that, you know, like the old thunder and lightning thing that they used to do up with the Giants when they had Ron Dane and who was a barber or whoever it was up there, you you know, where you have the one guy who you want to get touches because he can be shifty and make the cuts and is explosive. But then you need the big bruiser who can run guys over and can be your goal line guy. Maybe they do something like that. And you're able to get both of those guys at half the price of what you're supposed to be paying Zeke. I mean, I think that's a viable option. Uh, you know, we're we're talking about Zeke, and you're talking about you know why has he got the lowest careers of his, lowest carries of his career? Okay, mm-hmm. we told you a lot of it has to do with falling behind. Why has he got the fewest yards of his career on pace? We told you some of it has to do with the score and the carries. Some of it has to do with the line, and it's the same thing about why is Zeke averaging three point nine yards a carry? Man, that dude averaged almost a you know half a yard right. more last year. And he was averaging a full yard more a couple years ago. Has he fallen off a cliff? Because running backs typically fade at 28. And I'm reminded of a play. It's just one play. But it's indicative to me of a lot of the stuff going on this year. There's a play against Pittsburgh. And there's a hole there that's probably big enough to drive two Humvees through. Two tanks. All right? Zeke takes it. I'm sure his eyes are wide. And he's like, I don't know. Will I take this 25, 30? Will I take this to the house? And he's probably thinking all of that because it's perfectly blocked, Matt. Zach Barton's got the key block. He's obliterated his guy. There's a huge hole there. Mm -hmm. There's only one problem. Your boy. Not mine, but your boy. (laughs) All right. Terrence Steele. He's on to the second level, okay? He's looking for somebody to block. You can see his head moving. I, where's somebody? I don't see anybody. There's got to be somebody here for me to block. Well, Terrence, the dude you're looking for just ran past your left hip and has just planted Zeke on the ground for a two-yard loss. Mm-hmm. And so I promise you, I saw that play against Pittsburgh, and I go, see, Zeke is averaging 3.9 yards a carry because of shit like this. Oh, I said it. <laughs> well, it's true. It's true. Of stuff like this, man. And and that's exactly what I'm talking about. Stuff like this, man, where it's blocked perfectly. One guy who shouldn't really even be on the field doesn't do his job. The play's a disaster, and Zeke is stuck with a two-yard loss. And so I want to end this, Matt, by telling you, we just gave you a bunch of reasons why Zeke Elliott's not performing. Right. I don't consider those excuses. I consider those valid reasons why he's not performing. Um, The question is whether you can fix those and get the performance that you need to justify and validate the salary. Because if you don't, or if you can't, right, right, yeah, he ain't going to be here long. That's just a fact. Then you got the real problem. Yeah. Yeah. That's the question. I'm curious because this is, and this is what I love about being able to do the podcast. We can kind of switch gears while keeping it in the same thing. And we're not up against a clock here. And because I'd love to see your thoughts on this, because this is right around the beginning of your time with the Cowboys beat. Emmett Smith is with the Cowboys. He's coming off that 95 MVP season, 1700 yards, 25 touchdowns. He's dominating the next year in 96 at 27 years old. He still had 1200 yards, but as because he had 327 carries, he went from 4.7 an attempt in 95 to 3.7 an attempt in 96 and i wonder as as great as he had been for the first whatever it was six years of his career was there any talk in that 96 season that you can remember of whoa okay so all of a sudden this dude's hitting 27 and for the first time in his career since he was a rookie he is way below four yards a carry at 3.7 an attempt oh hell yeah um i can't remember the specific stories but it was a i do know it was a story but it's also because the Cowboys were falling apart that year. They had right. a veteran team, and in 96, I think at one point they were 6-5 and five and then lost their last five games. And so the hard question was, is it Emmett or is it part of a bigger issue? 
whether it's the line or the score or what is it, what have you, um, you know. So, um, no, nah, 90, 96. You said 96, right? Yeah, 96, 96 was the year after his 95. 96 was, the problem was they didn't have Michael Irvin the first five games of the year. He has been suspended for uh, uh, pleading no contest to felony cocaine possession. And so he missed the first five games. And then without Michael Irvin there, you had teams loading up to stop Emmett. They're like, okay, we're not letting Emmett beat us if you don't have Michael Irvin. Yeah, see, so I, I th- go ahead. Well, I, I was just because I wonder about that because it's almost like what, and this is what I'm just, and we don't know the answer yet, but like what you're pointing out with the loss of Irvin early on, and it, okay, well, you gave us six damn good years, but I mean, you're 27, and and running backs start to fall off around 27, 28, and I wonder if this is what we're seeing with Zeke, where, and this is what, like, even the best running backs need linemen they need something else to help them out from time to time somewhere along the way you know and you look at Emmett from his first six years where he was averaging I think like if you put them all together and break it down it's like 96 97 yards a game which was sky high and then he never really got close to that again in his career but was still a dominant running back but he had that one year hiccup and then started to come back he barely cracked a thousand yards in 97 well, see that's the year I'm talking about 97 because you can look at 97 and see what's the number that stands out. He only had 261 carries. Right, because he was still doing 4.1 yards in attempt, whereas right. in 96, 96, I mean, up, up until like the way end of his career, 3.7 yards in attempt in the prime of Emmett Smith's career. And that's what I'm wondering, like with Zeke, is there just so many other things that are going on? Oh, and I that's, think so. that's kind of the question. Is it Zeke or is it all these other factors that are leading a guy who is actually going to continue to be – what we thought he could be, but this year with just so many extra outside influences, it's just not working. Um, I'm going to tell you like like this, Doug. If you talk to people in the Cowboys, now you can agree or you can disagree, but if you talk to people with the Cowboys, and we know they listen to Zig Ziglar tapes and wear rose-colored Ray-Bans. <laughs> but Zig if you talk Ziglar, to wow. People, they will <laughs> tell you that okay. Zeke is the same guy. There's things out of his control mm-hmm. that have led to this, uh, this down year. Uh, but they don't think he's lost it. And that's them, and that's their opinion. Yeah, and I'm not ready to just say that in one season – I don't think the guy can get it done, which is why. And again, it makes no sense to walk away from him after this year. That's why I think you're going to see him next year. You'll have a better understanding of was it the benefit of the dominant offensive line of early in his career? Because surely next year in 2021, you don't have the same problems with massive injuries because it's not just one guy. It's both your tackles and it's your quarterback. You know, so like say Dak is playing and Tyron is playing, but Lyle Collins is done for the year. You know, you get one out of three of those injuries, and I wonder if he's even then being more effective. There's no way to know, but I'm willing to give him almost like a mulligan of a season based on what we've seen up through the rest of his career, and let's see what 2021 offers. And if he if he's going to struggle like this in 2021 and some of the pieces are healthy and it changes a little, then I think maybe after 2021 you look at it and say, okay, we got we to walk away from this. Yeah, I think it's like that. You know, the the game is the game, man. And it doesn't care about you. It cares about your production. And so the game is the game. It is what it is. And your production will either justify your salary in the NFL or it won't. And if it doesn't, I'll holler at you. But Zeke Elliott, I, I think we both can completely understand the frustration of the Cowboy fan and the almost, even when I'm watching the game sometimes, of the what the hell, hoping that Zeke can recapture what we had seen in years past. But obviously 2020, it's becoming a throwaway season, not just for the team, but for some of these individuals and a guy like Zeke Elliott. Excited now to welcome in, you heard him all the time on our show when we were all together over there at ESPN and, and really happy and, and stoked that he was able to give us some time here to do with us on the Jam Session podcast, the great voice of the Dallas Mavericks, Chuck Cooperstein, jumping on with us. What's up, man? How are you? Boys, having ventured into a brave new world, how are y'all? <laughs> yeah, had no choice, That's though. true, man. <laughs> you know, t- trying to figure it out, make it work, you know, keep it going. But I will tell you, we I- are having a blast because the show is the show. And uh, now we got complete authority. So, you know, it's it's a good time. It's just uh, 
can you make it work and uh, can you survive? So you like being the boss. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot. I yes. really do. <laughs> it's a, it's a, yes, it's a lot better. I'm pretty sure that we won't tell ourselves like 10 minutes before we go on the air that your job is ending. So hopefully. <laughs> I think, you know? I think that'll work out a little better for us. We'll see. <laughs> you won't throw yourself for a loop. You won't draw yourself offside. <laughs> right, exactly. <Nah. laughs> but, you know, there's a lot we want to discuss with you. But before we get into what could be a huge week for the Dallas Mavericks, let's talk about what we saw this afternoon with the Masters, the, the November Masters with Dustin Johnson smoking the field and really putting together a week for himself that, you know, for people that don't know a lot about golf, you looked at Dustin Johnson, I think, as the guy with just the one major win coming in that had, you know, chambers and whistling straights and those things that come into your mind. But Dustin, I mean, he played his ass off this week. He's the best player in the world right now. And I thought, you know, kudos for him for picking up another major. He was incredible. Uh, you know, there was, there was a lot of great play this week. Frankly, the, you know, the course was as gettable as it will ever be because of the rain on Thursday. Uh, and, and frankly, I think the, uh, uh, I think the November conditions overall, you know, probably made it, uh, well, they were surprisingly good, uh, because it was warm. You know, it was warm all week. I mean, I think we were all expecting, mm. you know, fifties and maybe, you know, low sixties. Instead, they had near 80 all week. So, you know, the, they, they got far better conditions, I think, than they thought. And then the rain let uh, the golf course get very soft. And, uh, there were some pins, especially on Thursday, uh, that were extremely gettable. Uh, because they, they, they only could limit their pin placement so much because of, of just how soft the greens were and where water collected and whatnot. Uh, but having said all that, he was great. Uh, you know what? 20 under, only four bogeys all week. You know, that's wow. never happened before in the history of the tournament. Um, and, and he has been at this level for a really long time. I mean, really for the bit, I mean, you mentioned wishing the straights in 2010, but I mean, yeah. you know, he also had, uh, he had the lead at Pebble beach and then, uh, you know, he, uh, at the U S open in 2010 and he hits that shot, uh, on the second hole where nobody finds it. He winds up shooting 82. Uh, you know, I mean, there've been any number of opportunities and obviously look, he had an opportunity last year too. He was tied for second at the Masters, So, um, yeah. he was great. Uh, but you know, there, there was a lot of great play this week that, uh, that again, was, was made possible, I think, by just absolutely ideal conditions for the players. Weather was perfect. Uh, course was soft. No wind. And, again, in, in, golf, in golf in 2020, uh, if there is no wind, uh, if there is no real weather, uh, you know, that uh, can adversely affect these guys, they're too good. And their equipment is too good. Uh, their training is too good. Uh, and they're going to throw up numbers like that. Well, what was the best part of Dustin Johnson's game today, bro? Today or all week? I mean, you know. Well, I mean, all the, week the, since, I guess all week since he, since he only had four bogeys and he won it by five strokes. Well, I mean, obviously he, he hit it extraordinarily straight. But Augusta has always been a second shot golf course. I mean, as, as Length matters, length matters everywhere. But at Augusta, because the greens, uh, how they're constructed, how difficult they are, uh, you've got to be able to put the ball in the right place. It's not simply enough to put the ball in the green. And his his short irons, his wedge game, uh, he's really worked hard on that. And it was, it was impeccable. It was just impeccable all week. To where I'm really thinking – you know, other than the putt he made on the fourth hole today, um, which was from about 35 feet, you know, his of the putts that he hold for either birdies or eagles, I mean, I, I don't know that he had anything longer than 20 feet. I mean, that's how good he was. I mean, I'd have to go back and look at it, but I don't remember him snaking in, you know, 50 and 60 footers with regularity here. And those greens are big enough that if you hit in the wrong place, those are the putts that you're left with. And generally, you're not going to make those putts. But he put himself in position to do all of that and really make it, it for him, I think, about as stress-free as possible. Uh, you know, he had a little hiccup there at the um, uh, early in the round at, uh, what, at five and six. Uh, but he, but uh, no one got within two shots of him, so it was never really in doubt that he was going to win the thing. 
You know, Jacques and I were talking about this earlier, and, and you look at a guy like Dustin Johnson, and we kind of went through it. I mean, he's been 19 top 10 finishes in majors in his career. He's been right there multiple times. Now that he finally gets this second major, I mean, he's 36 years old. He's not like one of the young guys on tour. Do you think that this finally is what he needs to start putting some in the bag before he gets too old? Well, again, what's too old? Anyway? Well, yeah, and that's a great you know? question as well, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, he's, you know, he's obviously committed to, to fitness and, uh, you know, keeping himself in great shape. I mean, he, he's got no notable uh, long-term injuries that uh, he has to worry about. It's not like he's had, you know, like Tiger, you know, back issues or knee issues or anything like that. Uh, you know, he's, I mean, he's healthy and he's, and he's great and he keeps putting himself in position to do it. So, I mean, there's no reason to think that there aren't a few more in their future, whether it's the Masters or whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's Torrey Pines next year at the US Open. Uh, you know, they're, they're, everything is in play for him. Wow. Now that brings us to one Tiger Woods. What were your thoughts on his tournament? And what were your thoughts on the 10? Did it make you feel any better about your game? <laughs> It should make every hacker feel better, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, yeah, they do it too. <laughs> you know, th- th- there are there are people out there who 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 you know want to disparage Augusta National and saying that it's uh, it's it, it's not a golf course that can hold up in 2020. And then you look at the back nine, and you look at what happens at, at holes like number 12, uh, number 15, uh, 13 to a slightly lesser degree, 11. I mean, where all that water is in the back nine, you know, if they, if, uh, you know, they put the flags in certain places, that water very much comes into play. And, and especially at 12, where, you know, the, the, the pines are so big there. And if there is wind, and Tiger, I, I saw some, uh, some of his post round interview where he said that uh, he just totally misjudged the wind. Uh, and you can do that, you know, where you think, you know, you hit your nine iron 150 yards. Uh, and that should be a normal safe shot for you. Uh, that isn't always the case there because things can happen even in the middle of your backswing and by then it's too late. Uh, so, you know, but overall, and I thought he hit the ball really well this week. Uh, I don't know that he punted necessarily great, but I thought his ball striking, mm-hmm. uh, save for what happened on number 12, uh, was really, really good. And listen, that's it good for him. Uh, but again, I, I you know, we spent the first part of this talking about Dustin Johnson, and I think this, this is really important because this is something that I've said for a long time. Um, and, and I realize that I'm in a, a vast minority when it comes to this. Uh, Tiger Woods is still a really good player. He's not, he, I don't know that you necessarily call him a great player anymore, but he's one of, say, 30 or 40, you know, who can win any time he tees it up, which is not what it was back in the day and right. but we still treat him as he was back in the day and so you know i i, I was watching him play well and uh and i thought for the most part he did play well but i think it's just it's really important for all of us to understand that that the, the game is changing and uh, that uh, we we have to recognize what's out what's out there uh in front of us what what the event actually presents us. and i gotta ask you Pat, I mean, I was going to say Matt, and then I was going to say Chuck, and I ended up with Pat. Um, <laughs> I was like, what? who's Pat? God. Hi, as you're, as you're watching, because I know Chuck. you play. That's awesome. As you're watching Tiger shoot that 10, and you're watching shot after shot, what are you thinking? Well, um, that again, if he can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> But of course, you know, it, it, anybody would certainly look back to uh, to Tim Cup yeah. and see, you know, Roy McAvoy <laughs> Dude, uh, keep knocking awesome. it into the water, hitting the same shot, knocking it into the water, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, I'm sure that's what everybody's thinking. Man, what, how about Jordan Spieth? Because, I mean, and it's funny because people forget he's a three-time major champion, which is not easy to do. And he's still only 27 years old, but you're talking about, I mean, this year has just been god-awful for him across the board. It, it, 2020, you just throw it away. And I, I think we've all forgotten he had a top, what was it, top three, top five last year at the PGA. But it just feels like his the confidence that he had when he was hot in his game just feels like he's completely lost it. That's the game. Isn't it? Yeah. You know, as 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 much as you know, 
physical ability matters and your ability to hit the ball well, uh, you know, you've got to believe when you're standing over it that you're going to hit it and you're going to hit it the way that you plan it. And when you don't have that feeling, uh, I, I mean, look, I wish I had that feeling at the level that Jordan Spieth had, has, has had it in his career or any of these guys out there on tour. But when you don't have a feeling when you're standing over it that you're going to hit it, that there's doubt in your mind, you will not hit it. Okay. You will not hit it. You will not make the putt, uh, whatever, whatever it is. And that's what he's going through right now. And there are, I mean, look, I'm sure there are countless numbers of guys that you were even watching out there today who are wondering, you know, at times, you know, am I, am I ever really going to get it right? Uh, you know, I mean, it's to Dustin Johnson's credit, he's probably the exception to the rule. He's, He's won, what he's won a tournament, I think, at least one tournament in each of the last twelve years, which is you think about. It, I mean, winning tournaments is hard to do, right, and he's right, done right. it at least. You know, granted, not majors, but but he's but he's there, and he's always he's like the Ohio State of golfers. I mean, it's like yeah. he never quite goes away. You know, everybody, every college football team has their down period. Ohio State never has a down period. And I know, and I'm not doing that just to butter you up, Josh. I mean, that's <laughs> absolutely the truth. It is. As we move from golf into what many of us believe, and again, Chuck Cooperstein here with us on the podcast is going to be a really exciting week across the NBA, but obviously for the Dallas Mavericks, the NBA draft is on Wednesday night. The Mavs have two uh, prim- premium picks at 18 and 31. It, what are they going to do in your estimation with those draft picks? Do you think they're going to wind up using them both, or will they make some sort of a move? I think they'd love to make a move. I think they they would love to be able to get um, a a what's the best word to use here a high, a higher profile third option to play alongside Porzingis and Doncic. Uh, you know, obviously Hardaway had a fantastic year last year, and you know maybe he's able to continue that. But uh, you know these these are the times where you, you have to be honest with your roster too. Uh, if you're in uh, the Mavericks front office and just, if, if you believe that, then fine. But if you don't believe it, then you try to go out and do something about it. But it always takes two to tango. And granted, you know, the, the two picks that they have, uh, you know, they, they do have some value attached to them in a draft where really after the top three, uh, there is no agreement on really who's who and, and, and what's what. Uh, and even in the top three, uh, there is a, uh, I think at least in two of those situations, there is a very high bus rate factor. Uh, yeah. so, uh, you know, so I think it's, it's when you're, when you're the Mavericks, here's, here's how I look at the Mavericks. Mavericks are in a position now where they have to try to show Luka Doncic that they are in it to win it every year. And whether that means the draft choice or whether it means, you know, trading the pick and bringing in veteran people, you know, they're at the point now where they have to show them that they are really serious about winning it all. Because let's face it, guys, and, and I know that, uh, you know, we just experienced 20 years of unsurpassed loyalty, uh, yeah. 21 years from, right, from, right. from Dirk. Luka Doncic is not Dirk. Make no mistake, he is not Dirk. When it comes to that, and no, and no, that Luka Doncic is being recruited by every team in the NBA right now, every team. And so, to the extent that the Mavericks can show him that they are just dead set about winning, and dead set about putting you know on that roster, and you know there aren't any more three year plans and four year plans, and you know. Uh, getting players to uh, be on the same age timeline and, you know, all these things that you always hear about when, when you roster build or that, that, that does not apply anymore to this team, at least in my opinion. <laughs> so I, I don't know that may be a very long way of saying I have absolutely no earthly idea what they are <laughs> going to do on Wednesday night, but I do think that they are, they are, they would love to be able to get, uh, you know, another more experienced wing, for instance, than they would 
uh, the player that they draft at number 18. Now, I've only read this, so I don't know what the – but I, I can't remember who said it, but it was somebody I paid attention to for whatever reason. Does uh, Gallinaro – is that his name? From Oklahoma City. Gallinari. F- Danilo Gallinari. Gallinari. Does he fit what they do at 32 years old? See, I don't think that Gallin. I mean, again, you, you, that would be a sign and trade because Gallinari is a free agent. Right. 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 Um, so, you know, one one of the things that that would be Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City, we're going to assume is also not going to re-sign Stephen Adams. So they they need a big. So you know, Dwight Powell, you know, clearly fits into that timeline for Oklahoma City, which really doesn't care anymore because they just uh, decided to trade Dennis Schroeder. They're going to trade Chris Paul. They're blowing the whole thing up. They've got 16 first-round draft choices in the future going My through 2026. God. So, you know, it's not like they have to worry, say, if Dwight can come back immediately you know, from his, from his Achilles, which I think he's going to be able to do anyway. Uh, but but the fact remains, he's, you know, he's on a very contract at $11 million. So I mean that's you know, that's someone that you you'd have to trade. I mean another thing the Mavericks actually need uh, is um, you know they they do need a big. I mean they really you know, if Porzingis isn't ready to begin the season, uh, and even if he is, I mean you know he's going to be load managed to a certain degree. Uh, you know we saw in the playoffs that Maxi as a full time five having to play thirty minutes a game, uh, it, that's a that's a rough go for him. That's that may be extending him out. Uh, beyond his comfort level, uh, but from a skill standpoint, uh, you know anybody who's big, who can handle it, and can shoot it, uh, is someone that the Mavericks are going to be interested in. He's not a great rebounder now, you know, for for his size at six ten, but he can right. really shoot it. And and his his three point shooting has improved dramatically. You know, he, when you looked at him throughout his career, I mean, he always looked like he should be a really high percentage shooter because his, I mean, just his mechanics are so good. But they never really, and that never really manifested itself, whether it was in New York or Denver uh, or in Oklahoma City, uh, at least until, you know, the last couple of years. And then really until this past year, he was really, really good. Uh, so I, I don't, um, you know, I, I don't, doubt that his skill set translates to how the Mavericks want to play. Um, you know, th- does he make them significantly better? I don't know. I, I given, you know, how Powell and the pick and roll game with, uh, with Luca and how that, how that all comes together. Uh, you know, Rick Carlisle and uh, Rick Carlisle and Donnie are a lot smarter than I am when it comes to stuff like that. But I, I think he, he, that would be, uh, that would be a guy that I'd, I'd I'd have to think really long and hard about uh, even even more so than I'm uh, thinking out loud with you right now. Okay, we're giving Chuck Cooperstein the ability to add one realistic player. Like, okay, you can't get LeBron. But give us a realistic player. If the Mavericks had it, you'd be like, yeah, baby, that's what I'm talking about. Well, again, I, I don't know if this you know comes by a trade. They're going to have the mid-level exception. Right. Um, and the full mid level, and I realize that this is this is not a sexy name by any stretch hey, of the imagination. But, Sometimes uh, grandma but, panties work. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Wow. Okay. Uh, but See, uh, but just but uh, podcast. not Drew Holiday, but his brother Justin Holiday mm-hmm. is someone that I would be extremely intrigued by. How come? Not the least of which, not the least of which, because he always seems to play really well against the Mavericks. But <laughs> he really improved his three point shooting game this year. He was a forty three percent three point shooter, and he can guard people. He can really guard people out there, and I think you can get him, you know, for the mid level. Now, the the issue for the Mavericks is, you know, for how many years are you going to give out the mid level deal? Because you're looking at it starting at 9.3 million this year. And then it would move up in the succeeding years. Uh, you know, do you do that? Uh, or, you know, do you try to break up the mid-level and because you're trying to keep as much cap space as possible because of everybody's favorite dream in the summer of 2021, if indeed that comes to pass. 
What do you make of the rumors with Zach Levine and the Mavs and that whole thing? I mean, 25 years old, it, it seems like he would fit. It, it didn't it, seem ob- like he'd been around 20 years. Old. Right. I mean, obviously, you've got to, to work out a trade, but the, the, those were the big rumors that were circulating everywhere that the Mavs had contacted well, Chicago about something for that. Yeah. Um, I t- Hardaway would have to be in that trade, right. and Zach Levine's better. Zach Levine's a better player. Uh, Hardaway now Hardaway will guard probably a little bit better than Levine, but Levine's Levine is a I mean he's a scoring machine. I mean he really is a scoring machine. And and again thinking of how Hardaway played off of Luca and how Zach Levine would play off of Luca because one of the things that was really bad for Levine in Chicago was that he had to initiate so much himself because they didn't have anybody else who could really score. Uh, and now he wouldn't even have to do that. Now he is that secondary creator that Rick Carlisle always talks about, that you've got to be able to have on the floor. Or, you know, a guy who can take somebody off the dribble from the wing, but who isn't responsible necessarily for the heavy lifting that he had to do in Chicago. Uh, you know, that, that number, I mean, he's got, I think, one more year left on his deal. Uh, after, uh, you know, this, this deal coming up, right. I think he's got one more year. Um, so, again... Uh, that would that's something I think I would consider because I mean he's he's ridiculously athletic you know even after his uh, ACL injury I mean he's he's still got his hops he can still shoot the ball uh, and again just the the, the the quality of his shots playing next to Doncic would be so much better than whatever quality he was able to create for himself in Chicago. Before we shift to the Cowboys, man, Luka Doncic. What do you expect in year three? Because the first two have been sensational. Well, I mean, I I expect that uh, I expect to see better free throw shooting. And I expect to see uh, a little more judicious three point shooting. You know, he's still going to take a lot of threes. Uh, I, you know, he he may not ever be a 38% three point shooter, which you'd love him to be because if he did, he'd average 38 a game. Um, I don't know that you'll ever, you'll ever get that, but he needs to take a few just to make sure that the, his, his driving game is opened up for him. Uh, but I think that the thing that I would really like to see from him more than anything else is improved free throw shooting. Uh, you know, he, he did improve this year. Um, even as we remember the end of the Clipper series where he could barely make anything, but uh, overall he shot nearly 76%. He shot 71% as a rookie. Uh, when he played over in Europe the last year in Real Madrid, he shot 80. Uh, there's no reason why he shouldn't be an 80% free throw shooter. And if he right. does that, given the number of free throws that he takes, he took the fourth most in the league this year, uh, about, I think, 9.3 a game. Uh, he, he already, believe it or not, no matter what, what he might think or Mavericks uh, fans think, he has incredible respect from the officials. He spends a lot of time on the free throw line. And th- those are points. You know, that's, that's how James Harden averages 36, right? Because James Harden gets fouled, and James Harden shoots 85%. Yeah. You know, right. um, Luca Luca shoots a better percentage than Harden does because Luca gets himself in the basket. You know, Luca, Luca actually, you know, he's, he's able to do more things there, probably finish better there. In fact, I know he finishes better there because there's no one 6'8 uh, or, or, or smaller that finishes better at the rim than Doncic does. So... Uh, if Luka gets himself to 80 or 81% from the free throw line, I mean, to me, you know, that's, that's real improvement. And, you know, uh, you know, as a rookie, his clutch numbers were great. As a second year man, his clutch numbers were terrible, save for a great shot in game four, uh, against the Clippers. And I would hope that, uh, you know, in that area too, that, uh, you know, he'd be making good decisions, taking good shots, making more of those shots so that, you know, we don't keep going through this. The Mavericks are eight and nineteen when they had games that were decided by five points or fewer. Then maybe they'll be nineteen and eight in those games, and that would make all the difference in the world. Yeah, that'd be a, a definitely a big one, <laughs> Chuck Cooperstein. Let, let's before we let you go, talk a little Cowboys here. Do you view this season as a sign of some real trouble in the organization, or is it more of just so many things have not gone their way? You, you kind of throw it away and regroup for twenty twenty one. Can I say both? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, clearly, um, you know, if anything that could go wrong has gone wrong. Mm. Um, but you know what? I mean, I look at that Steelers game last week, 
And that was the best game they played all year by a mile. And they should have won the game because they, they were ready to play and Pittsburgh wasn't. They, they, they got a very bad fate out of that game. And, you know, and something that, that happened. As, as, as we know, you know, good teams find a way to win games. Bad teams find a way to lose them. And, and unfortunately, right now, the Cowboys are a bad team. But they, they deserved a much better fate than what they got last week. So um, I, I, I will say that it's good to see that they've improved their run defense because facing Dalvin Cook next week kind of scares the daylights out of me. <laughs> no doubt, yeah. uh, but, I th- uh, but I think that, um, you know, I, I still have faith in Mike McCarthy. I think Mike McCarthy knows what he's doing. I'm not, you know, there may have to be other changes on the coaching staff. And, uh, you know, that, that would be understandable. But uh, I, I think Mike Nolan made a, a tremendous mistake in, in, you know, just not reading the situation. Just, you know, if you don't have time to adequately explain your philosophy and, and, and walk through it all, you know, through – normally I'm not a big fan of underwear football uh, in May and in July. But, but, these, but these guys, when you have a new staff, they really – they needed that. And they didn't get it, and their defense was just thoroughly confused. And you know, only now are we starting to see them play a little bit better uh, from a scheme standpoint. But they also need more talent. Uh, they need, you know, their offensive line obviously is not what it was. It's something that's going to have to be addressed. Uh, but the, but the defensive, uh, the inability to make plays is just astonishing. And Jock, I mean, you you've been covering the Cowboys. Uh, well, more closely than I have recently, but you know we've both been around here a long time watching it. I mean, I just—it's it, amazing to me that it doesn't matter who the head coach is, it doesn't matter who the defense coordinator has been. Uh, it really, going back, even I want to say to the end of the Parcells era, <laughs> this team cannot force turnovers, and if you can't force turnovers, you, you're putting your offense so behind the eight ball. Uh, you, you never give them a chance to score cheaply. You, you, you're forcing the offense to have to work for everything, and now your offense isn't what you thought it was going to be. I mean, please, at some point, they've got to find people who can find the football uh, and punch it out or catch it when it comes to them or, you know what, mix in a sack every now and then uh, or just a couple of big hits to make the quarterback think about it. I mean, that That just doesn't happen, and that's – you know, that's whether a guy's an undrafted free agent or a guy that's making $21 million. I mean, it's just astonishing. Well, let me ask you, Coop, because when you look at this and, and, and Jacques... I mean, I, I mean, Matt, I mean what, what do you think about that? I mean, what do you think about that? No, I, 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 we've had these discussions, man, where I, I just wonder the same thing that you do because, you know, we, when we talked to Chris Richard a couple of years ago, whenever it was out at camp, and we asked him, you know, how much of it is scheme versus guys that just know how to take the ball away? And then he goes through all this and he's like, well, we're getting close and we do this. But reality of it is, I don't know that they have ever had a guy that they drafted in, defensively that in college was a, a playmaker that took the ball away. Now, Trayvon Diggs did a little bit of that at Alabama, and we saw the couple of interceptions against Philly. You know, that's a guy that I think might be maybe their best option as far as being that type of a defender. But it, it is really weird that over the course of time, no matter how much they change things up and they swap things out, nothing changes. It's still a defense that never gets turnovers. And then you see some of these other teams in the NFL that have no problem whatsoever. Or a guy like Aminka Fitzpatrick or Jamal Adams that was available. Right. You know, that, that you well, well, but, but again, you, you know, you look at Minka Fitzpatrick, and he made the two biggest plays of the game last week. Right. He and, saved the game. And those are guys Steelers. in college that were around the ball, that took the ball away. And for whatever reason, the Cowboys, I think, don't put a high enough premium on finding guys who do that in college because they just have a knack for it. Like, you can go watch Minka when he was at Alabama. The dude, that's what he did. The ball finds him. And it's been no different when he's been in the pros. And they, they don't seem to put an emphasis on it. It's, it's almost like, well, let's draft the dude. Like, Cheeto's a great example. Let's draft a guy that, you know, has like two or three interceptions as a collegiate career, and then he'll get to the NFL and start getting the ball. Right. Yes, I, you know, and Byron Jones and Byron Jones was a, a lot of the you know the same way. Right. Um, yeah. Same thing. But it, it, it it's it's just absolutely aggravating to me. And you know, un, until they can get that addressed, then you know, I I don't know you know if they can ever reach the potential or reach the expectation that I think that everybody has for them. 
I mean, you know, again, you know, we, we, we spent so much time talking about the quarterback uh, and I mean, with some justification, but as, but man, as Parcells always used to tell us, man, there are so many moving parts out there and in football, much more so than any other sport that if you don't address those, those issues, every, if you don't address every issue, you know, eventually, I mean, you're, you're asking for trouble because at some point something is going to fail. You know, how, how do you best address your weaknesses? I mean, it's, it's un, unless it's like a C.D. Lamb and it's a no-brainer, you've got to take that guy because he's there. And it was absolutely was, given what we've seen behind uh, C.D. Lamb, it was absolutely the correct pick to make. But, I mean, at some point, you know, the, the Cowboys, for whatever reason, they don't value safeties. They don't think safeties matter. All I know is that, you know, you, you look at the, the, the best defenses and sort of the best secondaries, and, yeah, it's one thing to have a cover ball. But it's another thing to make sure you have a safety that if they're going to throw the ball in the middle, that guy's going to be able to find the ball. And the Cowboys have never had that player. I mean, they I don't know if they've had that player since Cliff Harris. <laughs> Yeah, I th- you're, you're probably exactly right. Well, let me ask you one more question before we let you go, because I'm curious, and Jacques and I have talked about this as well. If the Cowboy, and I don't think anybody's going to catch the Jets. Now, maybe I'm wrong, and, and somehow they stumble into a couple of wins. But if it's not Trevor Lawrence, and we assume that it, whatever happens at one, whether he goes there or whatever, if they're there at two or three, do you tag Dak at 37-7 next year on a down cap, or do you reach out and take a guy, whether it's Justin Fields or Trey Lance or, or whomever it is, as your quarterback of the future on one of those quarterback-friendly team deals? Give me the known. I yeah. mean, tell me, tell me that Dak's leg is going to be okay. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, at least Jerry certainly has come out and said that uh, his, his leg is going to be okay. Um, that he's ahead of schedule and all that stuff. And uh, you know, I've, got, I've got no reason to doubt that. Certainly got no reason to doubt Dak's work ethic because you know that's going to uh, – he'll, he'll do whatever it is he has to do to be ready. Uh, listen, he was on his way to having a historic season before he got hurt. Right, yeah. He was, he was not the problem. Uh, yeah, was he perfect? No, but he was not the problem when he got hurt against the Giants. So, to me – I will always take the known. And because this team has so many other issues that they've got to deal with, hey, I'm, I'm, trading, I'm trading back uh, and I'm, I'm addressing yep. my, my pass rush or maybe more importantly my interior of the defensive line. Uh, I'm, I'm addressing my offensive line because my offensive line is not what my offensive line was. And even if Tyron Smith comes back next year, I mean, he's starting to get up there. I mean, I've, you know, You've already invested a ton in your offense with your receivers and your running back, whatever his issues are. Uh, I mean, I, and then you, you know you try to amass as many draft choices as you can uh, to to make that work. Uh, because to me, they can win with that. I know they can win with that, and I think they believe that too. I'm right there with you. Hey, man, thanks for doing this. We really appreciate it on a, on a sports heavy Sunday for giving us some of your time. Good to talk to you again. You're a good man. We'll see you later. Take care. All right, Coop. See you later. That'll do it for this version of the Jam Session podcast. Thanks so much for joining us here. And make sure you tell a friend to find us, subscribe, rate, and review. You can find us on Instagram at Jam Session Cast. Of course, we're also available on our YouTube channel. Subscribe today by searching Jam Session Podcast. And of course, on Twitter at McMatt Radio at JJT underscore journalist. Thanks to Purple Elephant Music for the music you hear at the end and beginning of each episode. He is the radio and TV star, the sexy Jean-Jacques Taylor. And I'm just a guy, Matt McLaren. We'll catch you next time on the Jam Session Podcast, available everywhere you listen to podcasts.